have a very happy opportunity, which is to introduce our next speaker. Uh, you know Sam Waterston, perhaps from Law and Order. I made the cha-ching noise earlier, badly. Or maybe further back, I'll fly away. Uh, or in my personal favorite, Newsroom. Um, he also was a star of The Killing Fields, but if you thought that uh, all of his work was of that level, I want you to know that he started in Oh Dad, Poor Dad, Mama's Hung You in the Closet and I'm Feeling So Sad. <laughs> <laughs> so you can rise from anything to great success, I think is the motto. And uh, Sam is a board member of Oceana. He is one of the leaders on environmental oceans advocacy, and he has a passion for the oceans and the sea that was first forged on Matunic Beach in Rhode Island. May I offer you Sam Waterston. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. It's a very great pleasure to be here today in the Ocean State, my beloved Ocean State. Um, and I'm going to get right to what I, to my remarks because I want to talk fast and get this over with. <laughs> I would like to be giving the speech today that would change the course my country is on, but I don't expect a result anywhere near as grand. I will count this speech a great success if those of us who base our arguments on science, reason, and common sense get a little louder, a little more confident in answer to the headwinds coming out of Washington. Of course, it would be great if it also changed the world. Chaos is all the rage in Washington these days, and chaos theory says that a butterfly flying into a candle in Buenos Aires can set off a tornado in Texas, so I guess there's always hope for my little speech. These days, the news out of Washington is full of surprises. In the face of the daily shocks and explosions, you could forget that as far as the oceans are concerned, we already know everything we need to know. The administration has made no secret of its methods. They are disruption and getting away with it. It has declared its intentions. If carried out, they will damage the health and well-being of the oceans and therefore the health and well-being of every one of us. We don't need the news to know this. The administration has made itself clear. As a result, for quite a while, I think some of us have been almost drunk on pessimism when what we really need to do is hope. What won't do now is the hope we got used to over my lifetime that rode on a wave of common understandings, a wave which, for all its ups and downs, was rolling along in the direction of more sensible policies for the oceans. We're going to need something new. Our heads will be all, we always be involved in this project, but this is, first of all, a matter of heart. We are right to be wary of personal feelings coloring our judgment. Fact-based argument and cold, hard reason are the basis of good policy. Abraham Lincoln, passion has helped us, but can do so no more. It will in future be our enemy. Reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason must furnish all the materials for our future support and defense. I've been a member of the Board of Oceana for as long as I have, precisely because this is the way it operates, and I admire it. But two common phrases express two heart-stealing states of mind. It's being taken care of, and what can I do about it? The problem is too big. The forces lined up against me are too big. Both are great impediments to taking action, which is what the oceans need now more than any single other thing. Oceana's business is to save the oceans and feed the world. This is an enormous brief. It sends us crashing right into impediment number two. The problem's too big. The forces lined up against us are too big. The problem is big and the forces lined up against the oceans are indeed formidable. What with the enormous amounts of money the fossil fuel industry is ready to spend on manipulating our politics 
and protecting their profits, even as they know from their own studies what the price for continuing as we are will be for the oceans, the planet, and every living creature on it, including us, including them. All three branches of government are in the hands of people who have some very destructive things in mind for the oceans, including backing out of the Paris Climate Agreement and weakening our own laws, laws shown to work over decades in order to give short-term advantage to the very few. Among those laws are ones whose names are familiar as the pillars of ocean preservation, restoration, and flourishing. The National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. Advocates of this short-sighted and unrealistic course seek to defeat objections by denying simple fact, sidelining or silencing scientists whose work doesn't produce results that support their goals, and seeking to treat the Atlantic, Pacific, and Arctic, as well as the Gulf, as mines, rather than as the self-renewing and abundant resources they are ready to be for all time if only we lighten up on them a little. The hubris and ignorance is breathtaking. It is by itself an important impediment to clear thinking and for action a serious discouragement. If people in power are so far off track, so protective of their self-deception, so diligent in repressing facts that contradict their wants, what's to be done? The head shrinks from the odds and despairs at the pressure of time, but the heart knows the answer. Anyone picking an argument with Abraham Lincoln is asking for trouble. However, different times demand different responses and we need to get it out there front and center that our resistance, always confirmed and guided by science, reason, and common sense, is personal and deeply felt that what is refined and purified by science and reason is first of all a passion. For example, Dr. Daniel Pauley is a very reasonable man a world-renowned expert on fish and fish populations worldwide, and a member of Oceana's board. His writing, informed by humor, is however strictly data-driven, scientific, and rational. What makes him so productive? Why is he so familiar with airports worldwide? He's not a kid anymore. What's driving him? It seems obvious that it's passion. He loves his work the people he works with, the creatures he studies, writes about, and speaks up for. The answer to the fact that the worst are full of passionate intensity, as William Butler Yeats put it, is not coolness, but conviction, made of what originally got us involved in the environment in the first place. I grew up coming to Rhode Island every summer. Blackout shades and fortifications designed, disguised as farm buildings from World War II are among my earliest memories. When the war ended, after having given the oceans a bit of a rest, there was plenty of every kind of food from the sea, and prices were good. My mother even refused for quite a while to buy lobster when the price for a chick rose over a dollar. I learned how to sail here, how to swim, how to fish, how to get a suntan on my back without getting one on my front. <laughs> I believe it was while sitting on a beach in South County reading the newspaper that I learned the cod fishery in Canada had utterly collapsed. I was born in Massachusetts. My grandmother's house was next door to Cape Cod. Cape Cod wasn't a name taken out of a hat. It was a description of land surrounded on three sides by Codfish, fish so big and so thickly packed together, there was a time when you could walk to the beach from your boat on their backs. Now the cod have been fished out. This was a shock and unacceptable. The ocean I knew as a boy and its astounding fruitfulness were not being taken care of. Why and how they weren't speaks powerfully to today. The four factors were, one, technological progress. The war that gave the oceans a rest also produced the fish-finding technologies that made it possible to locate even the last fish hiding under a rock hundreds of feet under the sea. Two, 
ecological ignorance. The government didn't know what was going on and didn't try hard enough to find out. Ignorance did not produce caution or modesty. It produced wildly optimistic estimates of fish populations of rebound speed and recovery. In 1992, the very same year the cod fishery had to be closed, the Canadian government set a catch limit for, for cod that was nearly 50% higher than all the codfish caught in the previous year. Three, socioeconomic free-for-all. In what will sound fam familiar from today, the, the government abandoned its duty as the protector of the common interest and gave way to the demands, desires, the arguments, and influence of the interests. And there were lots of interests. And then, too, ordinary people like me lying on the beautiful beaches of South County reading the paper, did not act, hoping against the evidence that someone would take care of it, discouraged by the size of the problem. Four, governmental mismanagement, a combination of two and three, with added to them the government's own lack of interest, curiosity, imagination, will, and responsibility. Those four factors still threaten the health of our oceans, and oceans all over the world today. Technologies for finding and catching fish have only improved. Ignorance is still used as an excuse for wildly optimistic estimates of fish, fish populations and rebound capacity. Many of the interested parties remain less responsible even to their own mid and long-term economic interests than common sense demands. But what's new today is the active determination at the highest levels of the American government to advocate, 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 abdicate its responsibilities with regard to the oceans. The United States government is a big operation. I'm not confident that anyone, including the people directing this radical turn away from common sense and the common interest, has a complete handle on what's being done. Are effective rules still being observed? Is permitting being carefully done? Is monitoring and data collection being energetically pursued? For a certain kind of capitalism, retaining the profits while offloading the costs and damage onto the commons is a pillar of doing business. Are those the voices getting a hearing in this administration? It used to be we could be confident we knew the answers to questions like these, not now. But what's certain is the disregard for healthy oceans emanating from the top will either be called out or it will hurt us all. We can't let having reason on our side blind or divert us from the fact that the fight is taking place elsewhere where influence and access matter more. Those are the facts. For those like me who've been sitting on the beach reading the paper, like the song says, this means the time to hesitate is through. It's time to fight fire with fire. We can't afford to cede an inch of the ground of feelings and passion to any bullying, anti-scientific, or mendacious project underway in DC, no matter who is leading it. We must not stand for it when we're told we have to choose between good jobs and a strong fishing industry and a healthy ocean, when they are the same thing. We don't have to be shy about our conviction based on science and experience and rooted in common sense that a healthy ocean teeming with fish is the one dependable basis for healthy coastal communities, jobs, and businesses now and into the indefinite future. The oceans are not a mine destined to one day be played out. They are not a farm either, requiring huge inputs of fertilizer, labor, tilling and seeding, and fossil fuels to produce food for hungry people and jobs for people who love them and need them. They are a self-renewing resource ready to feed a billion people a day a healthy meal, sustain coastal communities, provide good jobs, and sustain strong businesses for the rest of time. All they ask of us is decent respect for how they actually function. In the face of every distortion and misrepresentation, we need to be shouting this from the rooftops. When the government is listening to reason as it should, then we will always be ready to make our own case based on reason, 
cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason, and submit ourselves to the judgment of reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason, and revise our thinking and our advocacy to align it with reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason. That is the age-old method of science and policymaking. But in the face of everyday efforts to blind our reason with misdirected passion, we need to refer back in ourselves to the deep-rooted passions that animate us, to our love of country, to our hopes for our children, to our knowledge of what's right, to how powerfully we care, and to our anger when anyone messes with what's ours. Because whatever your religion or belief, this planet, these oceans are ours, all of ours, ours to keep and ours to lose. They are part of what's called the commons, of what belongs not to nobody, but to everybody, and we can claim it. Don't get mad, get even is a fine old phrase from early Boston Irish politicians, but let's start this round with getting mad. Let's look for a battle-ready kind of optimism in ourselves. In the days when reason had a better chance in the marketplace, we could get along fine with an easier, softer kind of hope, trusting that reason on its own, as Lincoln said, would prevail. Today, when push has come to shove, we need an optimism that's as hard as diamonds and sharp enough to cut through mountains of obfuscation. A can-do attitude and patient determination has characterized Oceana from the start. Because of it, Oceana's reach has spread from the United States around the globe to Europe, South America, Canada, the Mediterranean, the Far East. Patience, persistence, and passion at the grassroots level in the offices of American companies, large and small, among Oceana's advocacy partners and its insightful and generous board is what brings ocean-based wind power to Rhode Island. This is one of my, I love this. <laughs> it's what stops an attempt by the Obama administration to open the South Atlantic to oil exploration. It's what gets Global Fishing Watch a way to track the activities of fishing boats all over the world up and running. Go to the website. It's free and open to anyone. You can watch all the fishing boats in the world in real time. And despite conditions in Washington today, and thanks to the support of your own Senator White House, it is what keeps the Shark Fin Trade Elimination Act working its way through Congress as we speak with co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle. I'll just name the Republican senators, Capito, Inhofe, McCain, Portman, Wicker. And in the 2016 Congress, 11 Republican congressmen were also co-sponsors. So bipartisanship is not dead. It, it's asleep. <laughs> There's much, much more to do. The clock is ticking. The other side peddles the truly gigantic hoax that climate disruption is itself a hoax, and Chinese. In the face of extended drought, record-breaking heat, unprecedentedly voracious fires, storms of unprecedented power in unheard of places at strange times of the year, this is a claim as preposterous as what the man said when he was caught by his wife in bed with his mistress. She said, you're in our bed with another woman. He said, no, I'm not. She said, I'm looking at you lying in our bed with another woman. He said, honey, are you going to believe me or your own lying eyes? <laughs> but this time, it's no joke. We are in the midst of a tough moment. Our job is to keep faith with the future. That future is plainly visible from here. You can almost touch it. Solar and wind power, electric cars, conservation. We just have to get through this rough patch whole. We know what's right here. We know better than ever what works. The time to hesitate is through. Thank you all for listening to what is essentially a lecture to myself. 
Ocean advocacy is science. It answers to the facts, but if ever there was a moment for us to get mad enough to make ourselves heard, this is it. Passion in the public square is not a field to be left to the opposition. We can't be disheartened by the odds, the powers lined up against us, or the future bearing down on us. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the head and the heart that when his head began to calculate and to compare wealth and numbers between England and the colonies, our hearts threw up a few pulsations of our warmest blood. We supplied enthusiasm against wealth and numbers. We put our existence to the hazard when the hazard seemed against us, and we saved our country. We have to find the stuffing in us to do the same today. The stakes are just as high. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Okay. You can ask me anything you like. I, I promise you I won't have all the answers. Um, in fact, I bet you know more about a lot of this than I do. But anyway, if anybody, we could talk about law and order. <laughs> yeah, Cool. So my first question is, um, I used to work for Senator John Chafee, who was one of the wonderful Republican environmental leaders, and he had a house on Matunic Beach. Did you know him? Um, I, he was a lot I think older I than knew you. His, I think I knew his father, his father or his grandfather, Colonel Chafee, very erect. So uh, he... John Chafee was Secretary of the Navy, very erect posture. He was born in 1922. You might have learned it from his father. <laughs> so um, then my question, um, so I work in state government, and we are, uh, my question's really about the young generation. I think when we look around this room, um, many of us are over 50, and when you talk and exhort people to action, you know, do you feel like we're reaching that generation? I know from my own children, they care a lot, but in terms of what do they do that results in concrete change? They're, they're disgusted with the Trump administration. They are embarrassed about America's leadership, but what to do and how to reach them. So I wondered, given your both profession and your involvement in Oceana, you know, how you're trying to mobilize that younger generation. Well, I'm so old that I have children who have children. So um, I might, you might know better than I what the young people coming up through high school and college today are thinking. Um, I mean, it's as obvious from what I just said. It seems to me that uh, while most of the work that is being done on, in, in favor of the environment is being led by science, and science must remain dispassionate and cold, that the, that, the, that the thing that makes change is caring. And I think my advice to the younger generation would be the same as my advice to all of us, which is wear your caring on your sleeve because that's how change gets made, period. I remember when our kids were little, um, they would come home and lecture us about the environment. I don't know whether people or schools are doing that job as much as they should be today. Do you? Yeah, my, my, our kids used to say, what are you throwing away? Why aren't you sorting that out? What is, why are you wasting water like that? I don't know whether you get those questions at home so much anymore. But it, it, it should be. Anybody else? Yeah. 
There's somebody over here. They need a microphone, I think. Thank you, Mr. Waterston. Oh, there's somebody back yes. there. Yes. As an Episcopal priest in this diocese, I am very moved by your words about passion and caring. Can you speak to specifically how you have seen or would call religious communities of faith throughout the state, the state, and the nation to address this most moral of crises? Gee, I think you would be better <laughs> placed to answer your own question than me. Um, I mean, the current circumstance that we're in, we let this happen. So every institution and every person, this is kind of off your question, but uh, Lynn, who's here with me today for moral support, God bless her. Um, and I had dinner with a, with a journalist, a retired journalist from the Washington Post. And he went to Yale like I went to Yale, like Senator Whitehouse went to Yale, everybody, you know, <laughs> classy went to Yale, except a few people who went to Brown and some people that went to Harvard. Um, but uh, he went to a symposium, um, and there were two major American public figures in this symposium, which was at a, a, a Yale reunion. And his, he said to them, we are responsible. We are the generation that's responsible for the state that we're in now. Um, what do we say to the next generation, the generation after that, about how we handled our stewardship? And he said it cleared the room. Uh, so it feels to me like everybody has a share in what's going on. And so while we still have the strength we should be leaning into it. I don't know, that doesn't answer your question, but, but I, I'm not qualified really to answer your question. Um, is this on? Uh, first of all, my wife and I love your show. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, in Oceana's opinion, is there any uh, danger or health threat from eating fish out of the oceans these days with uh, microplastics and mercury? Um, I think micro... I know that it is known that, uh, and this is all I know, this is a and this is a much bigger subject than I am qualified to speak about, but I do know that microplastics do find their way into the flesh of fish. However, they find their way into the water you drink, into the beef you eat, so, you know, they, they, they go everywhere. So what the relative dangers are to the different kinds of food we eat, uh, I don't know, but again, ignorance should make us lean in the direction of caution. So, and the only real precautionary step that we can effectively take about tiny little bits of plastic is to control and limit the amount of plastic that goes out into the world unaccounted for. I mean, uh, single-use plastic is the, it, it's sort of the most obvious business to point to when you're talking about a business that depends, as currently organized, on keeping the profits and unloading the costs onto the general society and the environment. Um, if you could if you could limit the use of single-use 
plastics, you'd be taking a major step to addressing what you're talking about. But, I mean, there's garbage on the top of Mount Everest and at the bottom of it, the deepest canyons off of Australia, so, you know, we're going to be eating plastic for a while. <laughs> sure. Anybody else? Yeah. Mr. Watterson, thank you for a great talk. I watched Law and Order for so many years. I keep hearing the song in my head as you speak. It's a little dumb, distracting. Dumb. But <laughs> yes. Um, you speak so eloquently about these issues, and uh, many of us trained in science and management don't have that same speaking gift. I'm wondering what advice you would give for those of us working in this field, how to learn how to speak like you. Do we need acting classes? Do we just need to have an actor that hangs out with us? What do we need to do? Just worry about your, what you're going to say day in and day out for days before you talk. <laughs> uh, but the other thing that uh, this gives me an opportunity to say is that scientists have been uh, reluctant to get into this battle in order to protect their, their disinterested position. Uh, and I understand the difficulty, um, but the time to hesitate is through. One last, last. Sure, thank you for taking my question. Um, as a recent college grad, passionate about the ocean, a lot of my friends do care about the ocean, but they don't really do anything about it. So how, do you, how would you say I can motivate my friends and peers to act on the ocean, and how did you get into advocacy yourself? So I can be like you one day. Well, you know, I mean, what just passed through my mind is that, that thing from St. Paul about everybody having different gifts. Use your gifts. And also, as, uh, as uh, is obvious from what I said, no single person, this is a huge problem, the oceans. No single person is going to fix it, but everybody can do something. And joining together and making a loud and embarrassing noise is something that almost anybody can do. Uh, you know, if, and if you can't think of what to say, swing your handbag. I mean, it's like... We just need to make noise.